Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Sales Masters Podcast. This is going to be the hub for any professional out there who's looking to get to that next level within their business. Not only are they going to be dropping tips, but bringing in the absolute titans of industry. Big names out there, like the people like David Meltzer, leaders of their industry. We're going to share with you exactly how they got there, the problems they faced, how they overcome it, so you can use them within your business. We're going to be dropping weekly gems that you can go off to help you get up to that next level. And we look forward to having you here on the journey. Welcome today. We are really spoiled. Um, with the Sales Masters podcast, the whole idea behind this is to bring people that are really experts in their field, eloquent in what they do, and have really got the right way about them so that anyone watching this, anyone listening to this, can come and learn the skills that they need. And Michael, may I say, every time I hear you on Clubhouse, you are one of the most impressive speakers I think I've heard on there. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you so very much for having me. And thank you for the compliment. Thank you for the kind word. You've got such a calm way around you. Have you always been that way? Or is that something which you've just, as you've grown into a better looking man, you've just developed this, <laughs> this way about you? Or have you always had this calm demeanor? Um. I think in general, I've always been quiet. Um, I've been more of an observer, uh, a watcher. Um, that's just my nature. My voice is just my voice. But um, I think as we get older, you realize that uh, you don't have to yell to get your point across. And oftentimes the people that yell directly correlated with feelings, emotion, and um politely intelligence sometimes and anybody that I truly admire they never have to yell to get their point across so I think if you're around people that you know you want to emulate part of the learning process is if you're around great people you're around uh, people that are great teachers people that are great parents people that are great friends none of them yeah um, the only time I need to yell is if I'm in a crowded place or a stadium or somewhere <laughs> where it doesn't make sense. Other than that, there's, there's no functional reason to yell. So, um, and usually if you're in a yelling type space, uh, that's probably not where you yourself would like to be. So, um, that's, uh, yeah, that's just my voice. That's how it is. It probably I think puts it's the listener to sleep, but. I don't need to yell to get my point across. If you stand on facts and you stand on truth, I don't think there's mm. any reason to yell. I find it fascinating you say that as well, because in a world where the majority of people that are listening to this are business owners, experts in their field, salespeople, sales managers, directors who've got companies, so all surrounding around obviously the sales world. And I think for a lot of people have a real misguided <laughs> overview of what sales is, how it works, or how they need to be in sales. Yeah. yeah. I mean, can you talk on what your thoughts are on that? One, nobody likes to be sold. Yeah. If, if they have one takeaway from that question, there's not a single person on earth that enjoys being sold. A lot of people equate being sold as to winning and losing. And um, people want to feel good. They want to feel listened to. They want to mm. feel heard. Very few people say they want to be sold. So I think that there's a way to sell without being making the person feel like they're being sold. And when I was trained a very long time ago, different culture, different everything, but I learned a lot from Japanese philosophy, right? In, in terms of formal education, right? And what um, Shingojitsu, uh, Japanese culture, lean, everything starts and ends with the customer. And if you really truly believe that everything starts and ends with the customer, then you understand I want something to I have something. 
Mm. And then there's all this stuff in the middle. The whole goal is to get you and the customer as close to pot as possible. Shorter lead time, better communication. Mm. But the closer my ear is to your mouth, the closer my hand is to your wallet. I like that. So again, the closer I put my ear to the customer's mouth, by default, the closer my hand is to their wallet. Now that's a saying, it's a teaching, it's a bad translation that I made, but that's what it is. <laughs> your goal is to get your ears close to the customer's mouth and give them what they want, how they want, the way they want, and the serving size they want. And until you got that down, you have a lot more work to do. But if you're in sales or commercially, you know, commercializing product or whatever, it always is about the customer. It starts mm -hmm. and ends. And at no time is it ever about you. And it's interesting how many people take, I think the longer it takes for people to learn that lesson and not just hear the lesson, but that big gap between hearing something and living it, right? And I think that's where you yeah, see yeah, no, such a big gap yeah. for people's progression in sales. Because we are, most of the things out there I talk to people about, I will often hear people say, oh yeah, I know that. And I'm like, okay, you know it, but are you doing it? And there's a big difference they between that they exposure. They absolutely don't do it. Yeah, 100%. Well, they absolutely don't do it because sales training, and I'll just speak to the States. I won't speak to the world. I do have a knowledge of what goes on outside of the States. Obviously, I travel and speak all over. Um, but the people here, the training and sales tactics, unfortunately, a lot of them are very heavy or... I'm being very polite in what I'm saying here. It's how to beat or manipulate people yeah. into a yes. It is not how to put the best product forward and listen to the customer. It's how to beat and manipulate someone into a yes training. It is not sales training. 100%. And then that brings out the negative, the ugly, the superficial, and um, it just doesn't feel good. And then that also screws a good sales force because you may have some people that that competes with their moral values, that might compete with their ethics, that might compete. I can get the exact same person and teach them what I feel is, an, is my way. It's not, the right, it's not the right or wrong way, but it's just a way. Mm. And I can compute a higher conversion rate, a lower customer acquisition cost, and help their batting average be better. And I refuse, refuse at 100% to use how do I beat you into a yes. Because yes. that's an inferior tactic. It's for the low educated and no customer likes being on the receiving end. And here's the litmus test. They know when you're doing it to them. 100%. 100%. And I think it's an interesting point. Is the point. sun outside? Yes. Do you breathe air? Yes. Do you like food? Yes. I got my yeses out of you. Now I'm gonna ask you. This is like, come on. What, what is this, a kindergarten? 100%. I mean, this is laughable. I find it interesting you say about it. And I think we're in such a time now with the way technology is, with the exposure we to have to so many different people. And one of the, the things I say to anyone who gets on a call, the first two minutes I talk to people, I say to them, that you might well not be someone that I don't or can't help. And that doesn't mean I don't make any money. All I've done is partner up with people. But if they're not the good fit for me, I pass that business to someone else and they do likewise. So you get more business. It's just so short sighted, isn't it? It is. Um, I think success unshared is failure. That's from John Paul DeJoria, who's the head of uh, Paul Mitchell uh, and also Patron. But I have adopted that philosophy. I believe in it wholeheartedly that success unshared is failure. And the sooner you understand, and most people will never understand this, they'll teach their kids, they'll say it that it's the answer, but they don't live it. So yeah. ultimately, they're liars, they're, they're hollow, and they're fake hype. But money's not real. And when you start to see that money is not real, okay? You see the world a different way. And when you say that money's not real, I don't mean that you don't need to earn a living to pay the bills, to provide for your family and groceries. I'm saying that what money is, 
you need to understand it's a proxy for effort and time. Mm. So if I give you an hour of my time, somebody pays me. If everybody can do what I do, then it has a certain value. If only half the people, it's worth more. And if only a few people or maybe even no people can do what I do, then it's incredibly valuable. Um, and you get paid accordingly. And sometimes you don't, but it's that. So that's what money is, or that's what it is. I can trade time, effort, and energy and talent with you and trade at it one hour for one hour, one mission or goal to one goal. Mm. Um, money's not real. So exactly what you said. If I do something positive or useful for you, and we didn't exchange money, I know that if I'm the right flavor of ice cream for somebody else, you're going to tell them, hey, you're, you're looking for uh, vanilla. Well, you're in a strawberry store. The vanilla store's over there. Send them my way. And yep. there's that reciprocity. People talk about the frequencies and the flows and abundance and all these buzzwords that everyone's using right now. How about this? Success unshared is failure. We could call it whatever we want. Abundance mindset, la, 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 buzzword, read the book, buy the guide. Okay, fine. How about you just share? How about you just be a good person in the community? If I need a cup of sugar, I go to your house, you give me sugar. If you need an egg, you come over to my house, we get an egg. That's just being a good pillar of the community, a good, a good neighbor, a good husband, wife, human being. I, I, I agree 100%. And I think it's interesting. I had a, a client, must be about six months ago. Well, it wasn't a client. I had a, a prospect come through and we had a really good chat for about 10, 15 minutes. And I literally remember saying I could have quite easily have sold him on my products and services, but I just know we wouldn't have got the, the results that I would have wanted. So I put this guy in contact with someone else and I got a call, a call about must be about eight weeks ago. Um, and a guy had come through and it was an email said, oh, can we book him for a call? I was like, yes, yeah, sure. So we got on a call and he said, oh, I was actually handed your details by this guy. And I was like, oh, great, thanks. And he said, we fit, he thinks that we do good business together. So by me handing that guy off, he got the service he needed, but then he remembered me and he valued me. So when he found, and ironically, the guy who's now started with me, the deal is actually worth far more because you find the right people and so many people waste their time and energy trying to force little deals and it limits your potential and your possibility you get well it's a waste of your time like i said 100 time when you realize that money is not real money is not real i'm going to repeat it so it's pounded into the list keep saying mind. it i like it money is not real time is real and when you understand what is productive versus busy and you look at time as productive or busy, now you have a super, superpower because everyone goes, oh, I'm so busy. You don't understand. It took me so long. doesn't mean anything. I yes. care if you're productive. Mm. And if I measure productivity or efficiency, which is ultimately the measure of dollars in, dollars out, time in, time out, right? Again, dollarizing back to time. If I look at what's everyone's financial measurement, the value of a company, it's EBITDA as a percentage of sales. It's sales growth and EBITDA growth. It's year over year profit growth, right? All of those go back to a proxy of time. So we keep talking about time. People mislabel it and they don't, they kind of bastardize the connection between things. Yeah. But it's always time and it's always been that way. I find it fascinating. Can we talk, can you go zoom back to the start of your career? I mean, you obviously, you're a well-read man. You've gone through a lot of experiences through there. Can you talk about the early days within your business? How did you first get into it? Where did you start off work-wise? Which one? Which one? <laughs> start from the start from where you were. What sticks in your mind when you think about that? Uh, my personal business or uh deciding to become an entrepreneur from the corporate world well i mean start with start with your personal business side but i mean most of these things are interlinked to a degree aren't they yeah so i played sports i'm just going to tell for the listener to know i was a division one football player american football player and i was also a nerd those two people usually are not the same people they're mm. not the same personality type they're not socially the same 
they're just different. And um, part of my day, uh, 4.30 a.m., up, Olympic powerlifting workout, Olympic track workout, breakfast. And then before people are waking up, you're already physically unable to walk because your legs are so sore and your body <laughs> yeah. is you just ran up stadium stairs and did plyometrics and bench pressed and sprinted. You you had an Olympic, by an Olympic coach, powerlifting and weightlifting workout. So you're physically fatigued and you got up about 30, 445. Now you go to school, except it starts at eight and ends at two and you don't get to eat lunch every day. So your belly's hungry. And the stuff that I did was not college. It was engineering. Huge difference here in the States. You start out with calculus and physics and chemistry and um, statics and dynamics and fluids and mechanics and programming. And that's what you do all before, too. While your body is beat and you cannot move, you're literally shaking <laughs> as you're writing because you're, you're so, so, so sore and you're mentally drained. Now it's 2.30, go get taped up, practice three to three to six, three to seven, whatever, and voluntarily run as fast as you can and slam into a 200 or 300 pound human being a <laughs> hundred or 200 times. Voluntarily, I might add. Yeah. You voluntarily run as fast as you can and smack your, you know what, as hard as you can into two, 300 pound guys and then get up and just do that for a couple do hours. Do it again and again and again. And then you get about a half hour to go eat. Then you come back. And for another hour, you watch individual, team, and game film. And another hour, you do the analysis. So a couple hours. And all of a sudden, it's 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. Start studying to be an engineer, which has an 80% weed out rate. And you got to be up at 4.30 to do it again voluntarily. Mm. Okay. So I took that, and that's college. And when I got out, I worked at the Intel Corporation. We were fortune number one. We were the most profitable building and company on earth. And we eventually enabled mobility through the microchip. So I was a microchip engineer at the Intel Corporation when we were fortune number one. We launched about 40 new products per quarter out of an $8 billion top-line sales per quarter building. So that's... Um, your first, your first uh, assignment out of uni or college mm -hmm. or whatever you call it. Um, and I worked long, hard hours there. And a lot of the products that came out of there or the companies that the product went into, close collaboration, they're everything you can name drop, every product, they're, they're the biggest in tech. So I started realizing that... Um, Shit, if I could do this, and this is easier than playing college sports. Yeah. And I don't, my body doesn't ache. And my, my brain I was going to say, you've got a longer lifespan of being able to do that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I realized, hmm, I don't have a work ethic problem. Nobody's ever going to. I was going to say, you've got that nailed down for sure. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's safe to say that I, that I could be disciplined with time management and work ethic. And I said, if you're good. And I looked at, I'm putting my time in and I looked mm. at, I loved the people that I worked with. And to this day, most of them have gone on to be massively, you know, names that you would know. You would know most of these people now because they're running major tech companies. Right. The ones that don't left and they started their own companies and they themselves are, I'm not going to use money terms, but by everybody's uh, measurement, wildly successful. Right. They employ large teams. They have impacts on communities. And when I say impacts, if I go start a factory, if I'm you and I go start a factory and I employ 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 people, I influence the tax base of a zip code. Mm. So people are like, oh, I did a million dollar deal. I did a hundred million in sales. I did this. Okay. When you start impacting the tax basis of your zip code, which dictates your property tax, the school schools your kids go then to. Then you're really impacting. Well, there's always another level, right? right? So it's interesting when you have sales and then you go, 
Well, sales is part of owning a company, right? I have salespeople, I have marketing people, I have whatever, if, if, if you were a, a business owner. Okay, I get it. It's another level, right? Another level of think of. So I was like, if, if, if I'm doing that for the biggest company on earth, and, and my brain hurts every day, you're making mm. microchips that can outthink people, and they're the engine for everything new. If you can do well at that, just like sports and school was hard, but then work was easy. According to most people at that time, there's rocket scientists and the new thing is chip engineers, right? So you're making a brain that they need to use to make the damn rocket ship and to talk on the phone. <laughs> and and do, right? So if you're actually making brains the size of your fingernail that can outthink teams of people, right? you're probably going to be able to make things that aren't as complicated. Yeah. So I looked at that and I said, I'm making shareholders money. I'm making employees money. I'm making a lot of people, a lot of money. And I'm not saying I as in I'm a me person, but yeah, yeah, we, yeah. our small team of engineers yeah. are making, we're moving the entire stock market. Our, we, our stock doubled every year. Our stock tripled one of the years right? Two for one split, three for one split. This is the original Silicon Valley. We minted more millionaires and billionaires than any other company in the history of the world. Wow. Tech, right? Tech. And we're number one in tech and we're the engine. So if I understand what it's like to play on that surface, I was 27 and I said, I think, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how the hell I'm going to do it, but I'll go figure out how to go make myself the money. I'll figure out something that I'm good at, something that people will pay for, and then try it. And for the past almost 20 years, that's what I've been doing. And I fail for a living. I fail. I make ugly, ugly widgets. I make duct tape widgets. They suck. Eventually they work. Then I come to you and you say, I want it green. No, I want it blue. No, I don't like your mother. No, you're ugly. But eventually, <laughs> eventually you go, yes, that's what we want. I'm in. And then you get in a package, put a barcode, and you might have spent two, three years spending money, not earning a single penny, mm. spending money. Okay. Very few people, a real entrepreneur is spending money and time for years. And then it works and you recoup all that money, the first truck that ships your product to Best Buy or to yeah. Apple or to whatever, and the money press turns on. And now you created generative assets and wealth, and you've created jobs, meaningful jobs for sales, marketing, accounting, engineering. You've created an organization and you've made, literally made something from nothing. So the to be able to say, Hey, I had an idea in my head. Mm. Nobody gave me a penny. I went straight into my pockets. I got my little uh, technical drawing pencils and pens and mm. I designed a concept. Then I made it happen. And then I got enough people to communicate my vision of something that doesn't exist to you and you to go, well, I can't see it. I can't, can't touch. It, I can't feel it, but you're going to pay me. Yeah, sure. Right. And to be able to get enough people to share your vision and be an effective communicator and, and communicate effectively enough, your vision. Now people follow you because you're a true leader. Yes. You're a leader someone chooses to follow you. So you have that and it either succeeds or it fails. People vote with their dollar and sometimes you're ahead of the curve. Sometimes you're behind the curve. Sometimes you're ahead of your time. Mm. Sometimes people weren't ready for the technology and things fail. Sometimes people aren't ready for your product. It doesn't mean you failed. You either win or you learn, right? That's one yes. of the things people always say. You either win or you learn. I've done a shit ton of learning. Right? <laughs> I've done plenty of learning. You've learned the life out of a lot of things. Oh, have I learned, okay? <laughs> people look and they're like, Oh, overnight success. Oh, mm. right. Anytime someone does good and they have that watch that's on your wall right there. Yes. That watch that's on your wall, that big giant watch that everybody wishes they have. Well, guess what? You're going to have to do a lot of learning and someday too, you can get that watch. 
and that's the one on your wall. Right? It is. It so, is. Funny coincidence that I noticed that over there. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't mean anything. That's superficial. It's silly. Yeah. It's fun. We're guys. But, you know, some people have paintings because it's so iconic. Um, so there you go. It's inspiration. Uh, so I did that and I've continued to do that and I've done it several times. And then it's to the point now where I've done it enough that um, people would like to hear how I could help them mm. get from their goal to, you know, get from where they are to meet or exceed their goals. And I work with people and organizations as small as one person, brand new startups, all the way to fortune, fortune 500, fortune, mostly fortune 100. And in a few cases, fortune 10 companies. And um, the equation's the same. The dance is the same. The people are the same. Mm. Uh, the egos and the fears are the same. They don't know it, but it's all the same. And um, I help people take where they are, where where they are at, or their product or their service, from where they're at to where they want to go. How do I go about doing it? I tie the financial goals to operational initiatives through Ocean Connery. I know benchmarks because I live them and I set them up for each industry. Uh, well connected through good relationships, and I know how to ask for help. If I want to uh, build a great team, I know the components of a great team and that I don't need people that is popularity contest. I don't want people that I even like and agree with. <laughs> so I'm not going to get the best stuff. I want somebody different than me. There's already one me. I need yes. one of you. I need one of somebody else. I need one of somebody else. So understanding the team concept and building world-class teams to produce unbelievable breakthrough results. Um, it doesn't even matter what the, the industry or the thing is, if it's a product or a service. The other thing is the effective communication and then the uh, marketing and social. So I have to be able to be proficient at that, to do it from my own. I've done it enough that I get the game. And now people might call me for social. They might call me for marketing and advertising. They might call me for product design, development, revision, or they might call me for manufacturing, but all of them call me to win. Mm. So my mantra and my stuff is I help people compete at game speed, win, and have fun. The elements of that are competing, which means you're competitive, obviously, because um, if you work with me, you're not going to just be there and take up space. You're going to compete at game speed. So I'm going to make you go as hard and as fast as you could possibly go and be the best you, not as fast as me. And I don't have to be as fast as you. I just need the best you and I will demand nothing less. I want to win. People enjoy winning and I want to have fun. So the spirit of me is, is my teams win and they have fun and they go hard. So that, that's what I'm all about. I love it. I love it. When you're, when you're going into businesses, there's varying problems that, or issues or solutions to find. Yeah. If someone sat here now, opportunities, maybe, right? the opportunities for change. We, we have an opportunity rich environment, right? Isn't that what they say? <laughs> what is, is there a set thing, Ben? When you go into a business, it might depend on different sizes, but you normally go, okay, this is my first. Once you've got a bit of an aerial view of what's going on, is there a set area you go, okay, well, this is normally where I look at for an initial blind spot to either puncture, fix holes that are in the business, find quick wins. Is there a set sort of plan? If someone's watching this now and you magic into their business, but you go, okay, if I have to go to one area, that's where I'd go straight away. How does it vary Absolutely. on every company? So every company, and, and this is a little hint, it's not as hard as people think. People will do low hanging fruit, brainstorm sessions, corporate retreats, fall backwards into each other's arms and <laughs> uh, whatever it is, right? To establish trust. Trust falls for everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for me, uh, and this might be a little bit too much tape on the glasses, is the one thing that with me, I will never waste your time. I am as critical of myself as anybody could possibly be. And for what I get out of people, that's a function for what I expect of myself. And I grade a really hard paper on myself. And it's probably a flaw that I have but it's also kind of double-edged. Um, so I will never 
do time and materials. I bill for an outcome. I bill for a result and I'm mm. going to get you there and it's going to be sustainable and, and achievable. So what do I look at? I look at everybody. We share the same scorecard, the same scoreboard, and that's the financials. So I'm going to look at your financials and then I'm going to look at what I think are the health metrics. So mm. I'm going to look at not sales, but I'm going to look at EBITDA as a percentage of sales. And then I'm going to see you versus someone else and say, so here's my assumption generically. This isn't a professional certification <laughs> gap and blank consulting, but I really go like this. You sell, you spend the money to make it all happen. And then there's EBITDA. And then accountants come in and play a lot of silly games and you get profit. <laughs> so I don't do sales minus cost equals profit. I go sales minus cost equals EBITDA. Then they play games and all the bullshit that, that the accounts <laughs> do. And then there's profit. But so I want EBITDA as a percentage of sales. So I want to see that at a given sales level, if you do 100, 100 uh, a month, 100 million a month, 100 billion, whatever the number, 100,000, $100, whatever it is. If you do 100 a month and you drop 10 EBITDA, and your company goes down to 50, I would hope you drop five, right? So I would say similar company, you drop 10% EBITDA, you know how to run your company. If you go up to 200 and you drop 20, same company, mm. right? But what people will say is year over year, we, did, we went from 100 to 500, we're better. But if you have 500 and you still drop 10, that means you you spent 90 to make 100 and keep 10. Now you spent 490 to get 500 and keep 10. So these people are like, we're going to sell our way to have a valuation. It actually penalizes you because you're just rewarding top line. And the, the thing that you have no control over as a business owner is sales. The customer determines sales and price. If they don't mm -hmm. want to buy it, they hold out. You have to put everything on sales or close the door. So again, it starts and ends with the customer. And a lot of people will get pissed off when they hear that. They'll be like, sales-led company, sales-driven company, sales, sales, sales. I get what they're saying. Yes. They need to listen to what I'm saying here. The customer determines the price and the customer has the money. So they determine your sales, not you. What can you control? Marketing message, body language, branding verbal cues, uh, market placement, proper product and demographic studies, all types of things of here's what we do and how we do it and the way we do it. And it's planned. So I can have a plan and get there or I can have no plan. So people have goals and they go, we're going to sell 100, 25 a quarter, 25 a quarter, 25, 25. Sales guys will all go, yeah, let's eat steak and go golf and get <laughs> and, and do nefarious things that our wives don't approve of. Um, but no, we, we weren't at that place where there's people that dance a certain way. Okay, that's, that's sales. And, and I hope that stings some of the salespeople real bad. What they should do, and then they say first, quarter, first month, oh, we didn't hit it. Second month, oh, well, well, got some warm leads. Third month, oh, yeah, we're going to project and we're going to just kill everything in the last second. Oh, customer back. Oh, customer this. Guy. There was no plan. Okay? Mm. And so then it's that's the first quarter, then second and third. And everybody's thing looks like this hockey stick ramp that's full of shit. I never need a projection. This is what I think about forecasts. There's two types, lucky and wrong. Mm. In a world with that many variables, if you can pick the if you if you got that much ego and that much talent that you can predict favorable currency, world economics, customer behaviors, if you're that strong that you can impact all of that, God bless you. Most people can't pick if, if you were that strong, you'd pick the lotto numbers every night. Yeah. Three numbers or five. You can't do that. So how the heck are you going to influence all that? So the two types of forecasts, lucky or wrong. In my businesses, I never ask for projections or forecasts. I say this, I have a goal. And a goal without a plan is a wish. Mm. 
A goal without a plan is a wish. One more time, pound it into people's bleeping heads. Say it to the people at the back. <laughs> a goal without a plan is a wish. Now, when I have a plan and it's thought out and I know how I'm going to go after the market and I have a realistic idea of that, then I know where I'm going, what pond I'm fishing in, what fishing pole, what uh, bait, and my success rate is going to be higher than someone who just wants to go uh, do, do the trust falls and eat steak and golf and talk shit, you know, all that. Great. But if you really, really, really are an entrepreneur, the only guarantee you know is that when you wake up, you're not making any money today. <laughs> so this whole thing of being an entrepreneur, the only guarantee is you make no money. And then when you do make money, you had to have a team. So with the team, um, they all come first. They got to be employed. So you get paid last as the boss, the CEO. So when people say, oh, I'm the CEO of this company, blah, 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 blah. That means you get paid last. That means that everything that goes wrong is your fault. You will in a accept that responsibility. And if you sign the front of the check, then you're a boss. If you sign the back of a check, you're an employee. That's it. Front of, if you sign the front of a check, then you're the boss. There's a lot of people like that they're CEO, but they're just commission-based sales, whatever, this, that, whatever. When you tell me you're a CEO, I think that you're responsible for a whole team, finance. You're responsible for shareholders. You're responsible for uh, a lot of stuff bigger than just yourself. So today... It's glamorous to call somebody an entrepreneur, or CEO, or this or that. But unless you're employing a team and having an impact and shipping goods or services, if you sign the front of the check, then yes, you're the boss. If you sign the back, you could call yourself whatever title you have, but that's not really your skill set and that's not who you are. So that's fake hype. Mm, I like it. Can you talk about... So I talk to people a lot, and I'm sure you've been in plenty of businesses where you've seen it, where and sales is an interesting one, where a lot of people get to a certain level, often above where their expectation was when they started in sales, and they stop learning, they stop applying, they stop pushing. And I think for a lot of time, it's that sometimes it's a scarcity mentality. What's your thoughts on this? Because a lot of people in sales, I mean, it is a great industry to be in. A lot of people. It's fun. It's the most fun, right? It has to be the most fun. And you're uncapped. I mean, some some people, when we talk about uncapped, there's some people that are uncapped earnings, but there's a limit to what you could really do because of the amount of deals you could do in a month. But there's some people out there that could really do a huge amount more, a thousand percent more than they're doing right now. What do you think is if it holds them back from seeing from grabbing the opportunity that is in front of them? Is it complacency? What's your thoughts? Again, it's planning and it's strategy. So, for example, um, not pitching on your show, but uh, somebody will come to me and their sales are stagnant, their market share stagnant or stagnant and I'll work with them and say, you were trained your whole life to live on the hour, on the meeting, on the next thing. You were trained looking a certain way. And when you expand your look and say, I'm looking at the whole year, it's a mining experiment. So you have to move dirt to get down to the rocks and the pay dirt and then the gold's at the bottom. Most of these guys want to dig a little tiny hole and just get gold and pull it right back up. And they're like, I got gold. I got gold. And just <laughs> little hunting pack, like a bird getting a worm. Right? Yeah. A true business person will say, that's not the best use of my time. I have to change my tools. I get this. I get that. A miner or a farmer. Okay. I'll use a miner first. They have to clear all the top. Then they have to get down to pay dirt. Then they have to scoop the rocks, wash the rocks, and the gold comes out. That's the most effective way. They take a miner's approach. A farmer, they have to prepare the soil. They have to plant the seeds. They have to water and trim and do all that. And eventually, the whole field fills up with all of this stuff. And you go pick it. Same thing. So you, you're either mine or farm. When you take that approach of 
how you spend your time, but the order of operation in which you do it dictates how successful you are. Now, a lot of people want to do sales. That's poking in and getting the worm. I want to spend my time on deals. Mm. So if I'm selling education or training, there's a lot of people that are doing training right now, um, whatever it is. Do I want to get in a car, go there, blah, 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 do the Starbucks, do the lunch, do the golf, do the this, just to get a sale? Most people, that's what it is because it feels good to win right now. It feels good to get it right now. It feels great to get a commission right now. That's what it is, right? It's mm. impa- Ultimately, it's impatience. So now I would rather say, I'm going to go say, instead of selling to a doctor, I want to make it mandatory that it's policy for the whole hospital to buy my product. Mm. So now I'm going to get on a board. Now I'm going to understand the the opportunities. Now I'm going to get in and they're going to write the spec to the item I'm selling because I was successful in articulating and effectively communicating. um, This is the benefit and this is what it is. And I only have to sell to one person the person that signs the front of the check. Yeah. Okay. Or I can sell to the buyer and the doctor and the nurse and they can have meetings and approvals and you can hold your breath and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And that's sales. And that's bankers too. Bankers, sales. It's just like, I want to make deals. Great. Einstein, you know, no geniuses are like, I want to be a sales guy or I want to be a, be a, a banker. No. But there are geniuses that know how to make deals. Yes. And there are business guys, bankers and sales guys that say they want to be geniuses, right? So, okay, they're a little bit different. And that, this stuff should sting so they can remember it. But it is it, it can be accurate. And some of people might have already turned off after their first one saying, I'll punch you in your damn face. Good. I hope <laughs> it makes you mad because maybe it... Uh, exactly what they need. Well, it makes you feel a certain way and you realize that you've been duped and you've been chasing the wrong stuff in the wrong order. So the people that I see that are great at sales, when they they plateau, there's only so many sales you can do in a month. Well, what does a month look like? Maybe I go and I work on the the head of um, a department and I show them, here's all the inefficiencies in your system. Here is why... You only do so many cases per month. And here's why, you know, whatever it is, here's metrics that mean something to them. So again, your ear went to the customer's mouth very close. Okay. Now when they're like, yeah, man, this sucks. If I just had this, this, and this, then there's this. And you go, hmm, well, I'm going to be part of the solution. Our rock'em sock'em thing enables this much more safety, decreases liability. It heals the patient quicker and the surgery time is lower. And they're gonna go, I can see more people and get it done safer and have less liability. Yes, well, guess what? You just redefine the spec. They kicked out their current thing because it doesn't meet spec. And the only thing they can buy is your product. Yes. And how many more sales do you have to do the rest of the year? I like Back it. up the truck, <laughs> go golfing, <laughs> and, and the truck's gonna be a Brinks truck. So that's, that's sales. I would be looking at how do I make deals, not sales. Mm. Deals. Give me the guy or gal that signs the front of the check. And if I'm not talking to the person who says yes or signs the front of the check, I'm at the wrong level of discussion and I wasted my time today. Might mm. feel good that I was busy, but honestly, I didn't do shit. I think you hit the nail on the head for a lot of people out there. There's a lot of activity um, rather than gauging how productive that they are. They're going through the motions, the 20 minutes. Isn't that business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you get paid to be busy or do you get paid to make a sale and be productive? Productive and results. To be productive. So this stuff is inarguable, yet people get mad and their little panties will be in a bunch and their feelings... Their feelings from listening to a grown man tell them the truth. Oh, tear, tear, tear. You know what? You want the truth? I'm on your show. That's what it is. You get paid the score. You get paid to win. Yes. You get paid to move units. 
you do not get paid to take up time. Yes. And the sooner you realize the difference between busy and productive, the sooner you'll change your view, your approach, and eventually your outcome will be massively different. I absolutely love it. And I think on that bombshell, I think that'll probably do. Anyone who's watching this, listening back now, they want to come and find out more about you. Where do they find you? How do they find you? How do they hire you? You can talk about anything that you have going on. Uh, promote yourself. I'm happy for it. Uh, this is funny on a sales thing. Um, I have no website. <laughs> I have no business card. It's been referral only. The one place you can get me is on my LinkedIn profile. And uh, we'll include that link in the show. Um, yes. So that's what I got. I've never had a website. I've never had a, a, a business card. I don't have my information out in public. But LinkedIn uh, we'll put the link in link in the description, link, link in, bio, in the description is, and connect. And uh, I'm happy to, if I'm able to help, uh, give me a call. Thank you. Definitely go and check him out, ladies, gents, however you identify. Thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, this has been another episode of the Sales Masters podcast. Remember to give it a like, a share, follow, let someone know the link of this that they can find this same great information michael thank you so much for coming on i really Smash appreciate it. that like button boom and that'll do they'll clear it up there we both did it at the same time what a way to end right we'll end up there and wrap it up michael thank you so much for today really really appreciate it um great insight thank as well so very much for having me and um a healthy 2022 to everybody and uh I hope everyone kicks ass and uh, goes out and plots world domination. And uh, I wish everybody is sincere luck and um, uh, I'm around anytime. Perfect. Thanks very much, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm so glad you popped by. If you've liked this, give it a share, subscribe, even give us a rate and review. Share it out to someone who knows. And I look forward to seeing you on the next edition.